Uh, we are picking. Lost my place. We are picking up. Fit eleven. We just finished, I believe, on Thursday, um, talking about that passage. Godus ira bar, that is, Grindel bore God's ire, and we talked about the different ways or the different meanings bore could carry. That Grindel, one of which is that God's anger is directed at Grindel, and he carries it that way. Another one is that he's bringing God's anger to the people at Herod. Okay? Um... He comes in, he touches the doors, the doors burst open, and you don't have a footnote here, but there's a, an Old Norse tale called the Greta Saga. And the hero in that is a guy named Grettir, G-R-E-T-T-R, and the monster name is Glamour. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because it is an analog to this passage in Beowulf. In Greta's saga, um, Grettir kind of has superhuman strength, and he fights what's called a draugr, D-R-A-U-G-R, if you want to know, like a troll, okay? And the thing about this draugr named Glamour is he's got fire in his eyes, as we'll see with Grindel in just a moment, and when he comes to the building that Grettir is staying in, he touches the door, and the door just bursts open. It's not like he opens it, pushes it. He merely touches it. Okay? Very, very similar to this, so that, you know, most editions will include, or many editions, will include a footnote to mention this parallel or analog. Right? So, he goes in. And he does what? He reaches down and reaches the first man. Okay, remember we talked about, I have a hall drawn here, sleeping arrangements. Beowulf's not sleeping in front of the door. And we were told in that passage, previous column, line 69, 690 and following, Beowulf's men think what when they bed down for the night? That none of us are going to make it home. We're all going to be dinner for Grendel. Okay? He looks down and he, we're told, laughs inside. <laughs> you know, because he's looking at not 30, but 15 men that he's going to feast on. All right? So he reaches down and he takes the first one, gobbles him up. 740 in, in passing. He finds a sleeping man, slit him open suddenly. We find out later how, because we get a description of his nails, fingernails. They're like nails, long steel, you know. Slits him open, bit into his joints, drank the blood from his veins, gobbled his flesh in gobbets, that is big bites, and soon had completely devoured that dead man, feet and fingertips, that is everything from feet to fingers. Ah, shouldn't do that. Um, and he does, so one down, that's like, you know, the first Pete of the first, you know, nacho, he's going to reach for the second nacho. And this nacho reaches up and grabs him. He quickly grabbed him with evil intent and sat up against his arm, line 748, 749. And you've got a gloss there. It is not entirely clear who grabs whom. Apparently, Grendel reaches out to Beowulf, who's lying down. The hero then grabs Grendel's arm and sits up. I don't know what that means. Sits up against it? I, I mean, I literally, I have no idea what's that described. How do you? So Beowulf grabs his arm and sits up so his back's against it. So he's cuddled up next to Grendel's belly and hold. I don't understand that language at all. Okay? 
as soon as that, and there's that word we talked about the other day, that here the shepherd of sins. Hrothgar is called a shepherd of the people. Beowulf is going to be called a shepherd. Now Grendel is called a shepherd of sins. Like, come here boy, come here little sin, like a shepherd does with sheep. Interesting phrase. As soon as Beowulf holds his hand, grasps his hand, Grendel realizes what? 753, in his heart he was afraid for his life, but none the sooner could he flee. He realizes, not like one of the regular, ordinary Danes. He wants to escape. And what do they do? We spend the next several lines with Beowulf and Grindel holding one, and this is kind of like a classic wrestling, you know, hand tied behind the back, and they're holding like this, and they're throwing each other up against the hall wall. But they never let go. Or, miraculously, Beowulf never lets go. Grindel wants to let go of Beowulf and flee. Beowulf doesn't let him. And this goes on long enough for Beowulf's men to wake up. Probably the first banging against the wall wakes him up. And they pull out their swords and start whacking on Grindel. To what effect? Why? Because we're told 802 and following, 801 and following, no sword, not the best iron anywhere in the world, could even touch that evil sinner. For he had worked a curse on weapons, every sort of blade. A curse on weapons, every sort of blade. What does that mean? What does Grindel have the ability to perform? Magic. It's the only place, by the way, in the poem where that is mentioned, where that's discussed. It's the only instance of magic, okay? And we're told, 805, his separation from the world in those days of this life would be a wretched work. That alien spirit would travel far into the keeping of fiends. That's the poet telling us that. What's going to happen to Grindel's spirit? It's going to go into the keeping of fiends. Meaning? Hell. Okay? He was marked by God. Top of the next page. So that his body could bear it no longer, but the courageous kinsmen of Heli held him, etc. Okay? So the loathsome creature felt a great pain in his body. What great pain? Did Beowulf cause him to heal? Just a moment ago when I did this and reached up, 2010, I think I've told you, slipped on some ice, tore my rotator cuff. Rot you've got four muscles with tendons. I tore completely. Every one of them. So, you know, just like that. Pain, like you can more pain than when I was on fire when I was a kid. Horrendous pain. But my arm was still attached. Grindel's arm is gone. How many of you have seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail? Black Knight, right? Psst, psst, psst. So Grindel's psst, psst. That's how they follow him, okay? Thank you for those of you who have watched it, because often I'll do that and I get... Total blanks, you know, just like, really? You're not culturally aware if you've never seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Great medieval, by the way. There's a lot of great medieval stuff because Terry Jones was a medievalist. Anyway, um, so, Grindel flees, okay? What does Beowulf do with the hand? Or his men, we're not sure exactly which one. Or arm, I should say. They take it and they hang it from the ceiling. Okay. It's big. Fit 13. By the way, I'm going to try to get us up to, well, I'm going to try to get you further, but up to at least line 1500. Because we got to finish Beowulf. <laughs> Remember, we don't have class a week from Thursday because I'm having surgery on other parts of this arm. So, in the morning, warriors come to the hall. Why? What are they probably expecting? Death and destruction. I mean, if Beowulf's men think they're going to die, you can be pretty sure the, Geats, uh, the Danes also think they're all dead. So they go, they see the hand, and then what do they do? They follow the track of gore. 
And the track of gore leads them to a body of water, a lake, a pool, a mirror. It's called various things. Some people even think it's an ocean or part of an ocean, like maybe a harbor or port of some kind. Okay. And we're told 851, they go to the water and the water is welling with blood. So think of a pool, not a swimming pool, but a pond of water. And in the middle, like a natural spring, where you might see the little rise of water, this is blood. Okay? And the poet tells us, when deprived of joys, he laid down his life in his lair in the fen, his heathen soul, and hell took him. Okay? Pretty judgmental, right? Hell took him. Then the old retainers, these, these are Hrothgar's men, turn around so they follow the track and they're reasonably sure, 99%, uh, Grindel's dead. They turn around, they ride back home. And some of them race on their horses for a while. And they celebrate 856 and following Beowulf's glory. What does it mean they celebrate it? talk about it, they sing about it, they chant about it, okay? It was often said, that is, this is what they say, that south or north, between the two seas, across the wide world, there was none better under the broad bellowing sky among shield warriors, nor more, the, nor more worthy to rule. So there wasn't a better shield warrior, nor was there someone more worthy of, what's it mean to rule? What's a word that we can use to describe that? Kingship? But, though, they found no fault with their own friendly lord, gracious Hrothgar. Ach, that was God to me. That's one of the three places in the poem where that was God to me is used. It's the only one of the three that begins with Ach, but, what does but always mean when it introduces a phrase? There's always some kind of contrast, always some kind of juxtaposition. What kind of praise is this? They praise Beowulf as the greatest shield warrior between the two seas, that's Germanic mythology, that's here in Middle Earth, the world we inhabit, no greater warrior at all nor anyone more worthy to rule at all. And then they think of Hrothgar. Well, yeah, but he was a good king. What, what does it need just to really make the sentiment complete? Two. He was a good king, too. The but, it undercuts Hrothgar a bit, all right? So... At times, we're told, 867, the king's thane, the king's poet, the king's shope, does what? Full of grand stories, mindful of songs, he remembered them. This is the guy, <coughs> not quite the same job as Unfair, but this is the guy who has all these, this huge store of songs and poems in his mind. Not completely memorized, where he sings a song, and then three days later, he sings the song, exact same words. No, what's being described here is oral formulaic composition. This, this theory, first promulgated in the 1930s, I believe it was, based upon analysis of Homeric hymns, of Yugoslavian poems, old English poetry, etc., this theory is essentially that ancient pre-literate poets, because what does literate mean? Writing, written, okay? Pre-literate poets composed poetry on the fly. They didn't merely memorize entire things, okay? They kept pieces. And what they would do, what a poet would do, is start to sing a poem, like, for example, what we're told here about Beowulf. And what does the poet do? 
He remembers much, a great many of the old tales, found other words truly bound together. The old English is the poet does the binding. The poet takes words in his lexicon and links them together. Why? For what purpose and how? Lily? I don't know, but I was going to ask, um, so when you say a poet, are you saying like there's a poet with them and he's doing this? Or it's yes. the actual author? Nope, the it's the poet within the world of the poem. It's Hrothgar's court poet. Okay. okay? What he does is links words together for what purposes? If you watched that video when the second day of class when I wasn't able to be here and I talked about the alliterative tradition, you know, old English line of poetry has four stresses. You've got two stress syllables in the first half line, two stress syllables in the second half line. The first stress syllable in the second half line determines the alliteration. Don't think alliteration like modern literary, you know, alliteration, okay? Um, what the poet does is he finds words that fit the alliterative pattern, which is why sometimes you'll see, you know, a statement and then it gets rephrased. Why? Because the poet has got to come up with another word that has that same initial sound. All vowels alliterate with all vowels, okay? Things like that. We could, mm, probably can't talk about that too much more. That's what the poet does. And what does he do? He creates a song about Beowulf, we're told. He adeptly, 873, tells an apt tale and weaves his words. And what are his words about? Well, we're told, he told nearly all that he had heard said of Sigamund's stirring deeds. In this tale that he tells his audience, men on horseback, about Beowulf, he links Beowulf with, where is he? Sigamund. Now, we don't know Sigamund from Frank. Sigamund is a famous Germanic dragon slayer. He's also called Sigurd, and he's also called, in later, um, Wagner, Siegfried. Okay? One of the three great dragon tales in Western European literature. Deals with Sigamund, another one deals with Beowulf, and the third one, Old Norse Fafnir, Fafnir. I don't think Sigamund's the one who kills Fafnir. Anyways, talks about a dragon. Talks about a man and his nephew, Sigamund and Fitula, okay, who fight a dragon. Fitula's not actually there at the time. And he tells us in this tale, line 891, okay? So Sigmund has his dragon, let's go 890. Yet it so befell him that his sword pierced the wondrous serpent, stood fixed in the wall. We're not told where this occurs, but we are told when Sigmund kills the dragon, his sword sticks in the wall, okay? I think this is significant for the simple reason when Beowulf kills Grendel's mother, he's going to get a sword that's in or on a wall. I think, I could be entirely wrong, there's not a lot of evidence for it, but to me it's eerily similar. I think it's the sword Sigmund had within this poem that's being described. Or the poet at least is linking the two, okay? So, he kills the dragon. In one of these stories, the one about, I don't have it written down, the one about Fafnir, Fafnir's a dragon in an uh, old Norse tale. In that tale, the hero, I think it is actually the same. Um, you've got the mention of the Balzinga saga in here. You don't have... Yeah, which is whale sing, I think. Anyways, the hero climbs down in a trench. He's been tricked by a dwarf to kill Fafnir the dragon. And he lies down in a trench until the dragon slithers over him. Because the dragon isn't like our modern conception of a dragon. The dragon's like a really, really, really long snake with little wings. If it's a flying dragon, not all dragons fly, okay? 
And as it slithers over him, he sticks up with the sword, kills the dragon. Dragon's blood comes out all over him. He licks some of it off of his face. And he suddenly understands the speech of birds. It's one of the reasons the dwarf wants him to kill the dragon, is to get the dragon's blood so the dwarf can drink it and understand the, le- the speech of birds. The birds tell him, Reagan's going to kill, Reagan's the name of the dwarf. He's going to kill you. So he pulls a fast one on the dwarf. Anyways, the serpent melts in its own heat. We're going to see something else melt later on. I, that's why I think there's some, there's some connection between this and, and what happens with Beowulf in his battle with Grindel's mother. Okay? He was the most famous of exiles, far and wide, among all people, protector warriors, for his noble deeds. That's talking about Sigamund. Okay? He had prospered for them since the struggles of Haramod had seized his might and valor. Who the blank is Haramod? We have to have a footnote. It's thought that an Anglo-Saxon audience probably didn't. They were probably familiar with the vast majority of names in the poem. I throw out the name Benedict Arnold, and almost all of you have some reference to that. Okay? I throw out the name Benedict Arnold in Europe. They don't know Benedict Arnold from James Dean. Actually, take that back. They would know James Dean, but not Benedict Arnold. It has a cultural significance. These names probably had a cultural significance in terms of mythology, stories. Question? Oh, I was going to say, who is, uh, wasn't he like an ancestor of Shio? Sh- 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 Which one? Haramod? Yes. Well, not necessarily of Sh- We don't know exactly, okay, in, in terms of the direct ancestry. Why is Haramod mentioned here? Or why is he mentioned at all? He is the image of the opposite of that. If that was good kinning, Haramod is that was bad kinning. He's the ideal bad king. He's going to be referred to a couple of times. Okay? This time, we don't get a lot of information about him. We get some. Some of the information is that how does he die? Look at what happens to him. Among the Jutes, that is, the people he was a part of, and your gloss tells you, Eotens is what it says in the manuscript, which is the old English word for giants. Okay? He was betrayed into his enemy's hands, quickly dispatched, that is, killed. Now, if he was betrayed, who had to do the betraying? Louder? His own people. I, I used the analogy in my first class. You know, Joe Biden's in Europe. He was in um, Ukraine the other day. If Zelensky handed him over to Putin, that wouldn't be a betrayal. Why? Because Zelensky's president of Ukraine. He has nothing to do with America. He's not American. That would not be a betrayal. If Anthony Blinken or Jake Sullivan, Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, Kamala Harris, Vice President, betrayed him or gave him to Putin, that would be a betrayal. Betrayal has to be done by your people. So why was he betrayed into his enemy's hands? Because that violates what of that Germanic fourfold ethic? Number one, duty to one's Lord. The surging of cares had crippled him too long. Yes? Um, even if they're a bad lord or a bad king. That's what we're getting to. That's why he was betrayed. Okay? The surging of cares had crippled him too long. Doesn't that sound like somebody else we've heard about? Who else in the poem has had his brain seething with cares for a long time? Hrothgar. Okay? But they're not the same. He became a deadly burden to his own people, to all noblemen. Was Hrothgar a deadly burden? Not really. 
For many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways who had looked to him for relief from affliction. Did Hrothgar's men look to him for relief from affliction? They should have. But we're not told anything about Hrothgar's headstrong ways. If someone's described as headstrong, what does it usually mean? Stubborn. Stubborn? What else? What's the stubbornness come from? Often. Not all the time. Pride. Arrogance. I'm right. I'm the only one who's right. The rest of you are all wrong. You know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Hope that the prince's son would prosper, receive his father's rank, rule his people, hoard his fortress, his kingdom of heroes, the shielding the homeland, etc. Okay? The kinsmen of Helak, now who is that referring to? Beowulf. So why not just say Beowulf? It's because the word that gets translated kinsmen is going to be the one that determines the alliteration for the line. Okay? And it probably needed, I don't know what it is, I literally, 913. Yeah, my Helak is Manakin. My, man of Helak, man of his race, essentially, or the, um, was Abel of Helak, his people's man, kinsman of Helak, uh, lost my place, became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. Who's that referring to? Beowulf. So the poet, within kind of the poem, okay, talks about Sigmund, Mentions Beowulf in connection with Sigamund, a little bit of foreshadowing, by the way, because Beowulf's going to kill a dragon, just like Sigamund does. And by the way, by comparing him to Sigamund, he's comparing him to the exemplar of Germanic heroes, the greatest Germanic hero who ever was. All right? And then the poet mentions Haramod, not the poet within the world of the poem. The poet relating the entire poem compares Beowulf to Haramod. How so? Haramod is the antitype. He is the opposite of Beowulf. Kinsman of Helak became to all the race of mankind, notice, a more pleasant friend. That's because Haramod was not a pleasant friend at all. But it's also interesting here that the poet says to all the race of mankind, not just to the shieldings. And then we have sin possessed him. Him who? When I was teaching graduate uh, Old English and Beowulf and stuff, the things that troubled students the most, much of the time, pronouns. Because a lot of the time, it's not clear who's being referred to. The him is Haramod. Sin possessed Haramod. Beowulf, the kinsman of Helak, was a more pleasant friend to mankind. Okay? So they keep writing back. Fit 14. Hrothgar, just before Fit 14, Hrothgar and Welthael come out of Welthael's chambers, and we're told Hrothgar has a retinue in or with his great entourage, chosen retinue, and the queen comes with her troop of maidens. Now, it's not clear in the manuscript if the great entourage, the chosen retinue, are like his personal bodyguards, secret service protection or if that great entourage personal retinue is the troop of maidens. Because if it is, that's not a glorious portrayal of Hrothgar. Being followed by a bunch of women. He's going to Herod for the first time, apparently, in the morning. After Beowulf has just cleansed Herod, okay? And he speaks. He goes to the hall, he stands on the steps, he looks inside, he sees Grindel's arm. For this sight, 928, 
Let us swiftly offer thanks to the Almighty. Much have I endured of dire grief from Grendel, but God may always work. Shepherd of glory. Remember, Grendel was called shepherd of sins. God's the shepherd of glory. Wonder upon wonder. God may always work. Wonder upon wonder. Doesn't that then raise a question? Why didn't he two days ago? How long has Beowulf been there? One day. This is the next morning. He got there sometime the previous afternoon, I guess. So why didn't God work wonder upon wonder two days ago? Or three days ago, or 365, or 730, or do the math. It was not long ago that I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my woes. How not long ago was it? Uh, 24 hours? I mean, it's just been one day. When stained with blood, this best of houses stood dripping, gory, a widespread woe to all wise men who did not expect that they might ever defend the people's fortress from its foes. To who? To all wise men. Does he mean all wise men throughout the world? No, he means all wise men locally. His counselors and advisors. They didn't expect anything to change either. Now a retainer, that is, not a wise man, so to speak. <coughs> Retainers were there for one purpose. Brawn, not brains. Now a retainer has done the very deed. Through the might of God. Notice what Hrothgar, Hrothgar is telling his audience. And through Hrothgar, Hrothgar the poet slash author. I had written up here the other day talking about the Boethian stuff, synergy, God and humanity working together in tandem. Notice he says, the retainer has done the very deed through the might of God. What if Beowulf had never decided to come? Could God have done the, pro done the deed himself? Theoretically, yes, he could have. But... It, you know, it would be literally a deus ex machina, God from the machine. It would be supernatural divine intervention, okay? He's not saying that's what happened. He's saying it was Beowulf, and Beowulf did it how? Because he has the strength of 30 men in each hand grip. Where did Beowulf get that strength? Go back to Hrothgar's first speech about Beowulf. I knew him being a boy, he goes on, We've heard stories about him from the seafarers, and what else does he say? Almighty God has given him the strength of 30 men in each hand. Okay? Yes? So is his intention here, like, to kind of diminish Beowulf's glory? Because all the men are looking at him um, above the at this point? Oh, I never even considered it that way. That's a good question. Him, yeah. I mean, he is still singling out Beowulf right. because God chose him to work through. God didn't choose Hrothgar. He didn't choose Unferth. And God can always do whatever it is he wants to do. Hrothgar says, and the poet says. But it, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question because it is a way to kind of tamp down a little bit of the, you know, the greatest shield warrior the world has ever seen. Yeah, but if he didn't have God on his side, <laughs> he, w what would he be? Interest, very, yeah, that's, that requires more thought. So, through the might of God, which we all could not contrive to do with all our cleverness. Notice what it, what is it that gets the deed done? It's the might of God through Beowulf, not not intellect, 
not cleverness, not plans, not conspiracies, not prayers to the slayer of souls. Lo, that woman could say, whoever is born such a son into the race of men, if she still lives, let the God of old look good to her in childbearing. Now, who's he talking about? Beowulf's mother. Okay, the God of old, what's the word he says? Was good to her in childbearing. The poet, through Hrothgar, is saying, this woman is blessed because of her son. Some of us, Babel scholars, see an illusion here. This is like an illusion to Mary. Mary's Magnificat. Go back, it's in Luke. Um, go back and read the words of Mary when she goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary is just newly pregnant, three months, with Jesus. Okay? And she goes, and Elizabeth says, you know, who am I that I should have the mother of my Savior come and visit me? And then Mary goes on, you know, I will be blessed among all people, blah, blah, among all women of the earth. It's kind of what we have here encapsulated. That is in very smallest form. It's kind of interesting that he doesn't name her. And he says, that woman could say, whoever has borne such a son. He knows who she is. How do I know that? Because he told us. He says, Hrevel gave, when he first talks about Beowulf, when Wolfgar comes in and announces Beowulf's here, he says, Hrevel gave his only daughter in marriage to Ijthael. That's after he says, I knew him being but a boy. But again, she's still not named. So he says to Beowulf, now I will cherish you, Beowulf, best of men, like a son in my heart. Okay? Hold well henceforth your new kinship. I'll give you lots of treasure, etc. Okay? When Hrothgar speaks this, who hears? The reason I'm asking is because we were told, line 920 and following, the king himself goes from the woman's chambers, his royal queen with him. He gets to the hall. He's standing on the steps. Kind of implies, where's Wealthal? Beside him? Maybe one step behind her? She should be nearby when all of this is said. And so what does he say to Beowulf? I will cherish you like the sun in my heart. Okay? Hold well henceforth this new kinship. Does that mean he's adopted Beowulf? Yes, question. Um, do they think that Grendel is dead? Yes. Because they have the arm and, and they follow the gore to the lake and the lake is welling up with blood. That's why I said, you know, they're mostly sure. 99% sure. And the, we're going to find out he is dead. Because Beowulf's going to visit his body in a few hours. Excuse me. The next day, Beowulf's going to go jump in the mirror. Um, and he's going to find Grendel's body. And it's swollen. Why would his body be swollen? Think roadkill. Side of the road. Deer's lying there for a couple of days. He gets all bloated. And eventually, if nothing happens, it explodes. Well, Beowulf's going to chop the body with a sword and it's going to explode. Okay? <clears throat> I used to love teaching this right after dinner, you know, because I'd get all kinds of facial expressions on the students' faces. So, does Beowulf adopt, excuse me, does Hrothgar adopt Beowulf? He says, in my heart you'll be like a son. He's got two sons, which we're going to talk about, hopefully, in a few minutes. Okay? Beowulf then speaks. I really wanted to have Grindel's body here. I didn't want to let him go. But he says, 967, the creator did not wish it. That is, God and I weren't working in synergy on that. I had one wish and desire. 
to keep Grindel here. Why? So that everybody would know he's dead. People can live without an arm. I mean, not blood splitting up for very long, but they can live for, you know. He wanted there to be the proof, but God didn't wish that, all right? So now notice what Beowulf says about Grindel's eternal state. So he says, no, he went away, the loathsome stranger, destroyer, 974, will live no longer, rotten with sin, pain has seized him, and it's baleful bonds, 977. And there he shall abide. That is where he's gone off to die. Guilty of his crimes, he'll abide what? Abide means wait for the greater judgment. That is a biblical illusion. Because there's the first judgment and the final judgment. There's the smaller judgment, death. And then there's the greater judgment, final judgment, eternal judgment. Judgment, blessedness, or, you know, pain. The greater judgment, how the shining maker wishes to sentence him. Notice what Beowulf doesn't say. That the poet did. The poet said, he's going to burn in hell. Beowulf says, God's decision. Just like Beowulf said, before the battle even begun, let the Lord decide who to take. Whoever lives, what does that mean? That's the one who has the Lord's favor. And then we're told Unferth was more silent. The son of Edgelof. Why? Well, it's early in the morning. What has he probably not started doing yet? Last time Unferth spoke, what did Beowulf accuse him of? Drunk with beer. Okay, so now he's a little more silent. Why? He has the proof. Okay. Uh, fit 15. They clean up Herod. Why? They're going to have a party. Okay, now what's... Um, skipping a bunch for a moment. Fit 19... No, take that back. Fit 20. After Grindel's mother comes, I'm jumping ahead for just a moment. Hrothgar says, line 1345. Again, after Grindel's mother comes, and after she kills Hrothgar's most trusted advisor, friend, counselor. I've heard countrymen and hall counselors among my people report this, that they've seen two such creatures. They're getting, go back to the, where we were. They're getting ready to party. They're going to have a good party. What does Beowulf not know at this point? Two monsters, not just one. Okay? So, uh, I'm going to skip that part. Round 10, 14. So everybody takes their places in the hall. And we're told, Fairly those kinsmen took many a full mead cup, stout-hearted in the high hall, Hrothgar and Hrothulf. It's the first time we've been introduced to Hrothulf. Okay. Hrothulf is Hrothgar's nephew. And you got a footnote down there. Hrothgar and Hrothulf, Herat within was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. Okay. Implicit in this statement is the idea that at some later time, the people of the Shieldings did plot false treacheries. From other sources, Norse sources, it's possible to infer that after the death of Hrothgar, his nephew, nephew Hrothulf ruled rather than Hretherick. Well, that's a very benign non-judgmental way of stating what those other sources say happened. Hrothulf usurped the throne. Okay? 
What should happen? Think Lion King. What should happen when Mufasa dies? Because you've all seen Lion King. Simba should reign. Who reigns instead? Oh. Scar. By the way, it's Hamlet. You know, Hamlet Senior, Claudius, Hamlet Junior, etc. It's just Hamlet. Uh, I almost said Scar takes over. Hrothulf, in those other sources, takes over. He usurps his place. That is Hrethred's place. Okay. The poet is probably alluding to that. That is. The audience, when they hear this line, no false treachery did the people of the Shilties plot at that time. That's meant to be ironic. That is, the audience understands, yeah, at that time. Give them a few years and all kinds of false treacheries will be plotted. Okay? So, Hrothgar gives Beowulf his father's, Hrothgar's father's, sword. Family heirloom. And a whole bunch of other stuff. Horses and treasure, etc. Okay? Um, fit 16. He's not done handing out treasure. He gives treasure to Beowulf's men. <clears throat> Why? Well, when Beowulf responded to Hrothgar's previous long speech, 958, what does Beowulf say? Freely and gladly have we fought this fight. He's not using we in the royal we sense. He means we, I, and my 14 men. I mean, they tried, right? They did try to hit Grendel with their swords. It didn't do any good. What's Beowulf doing? He's spreading the glory. He's saying, it wasn't just me, all my men. So Hrothgar gives them treasure too. And then he does one other thing. He pays Ware Guild for the guy who died. Why? Was it his fault? Hanshu died? No. I mean, think of that scene again. Grindel comes. They know Grindel's coming. And Beowulf watches to see how Grindel operates. Rewind the film for a few minutes and put yourself in Han Shu, the guy who dies, in his shoes. What are you thinking if you know what's going to happen? What gives? Why me? Why not Fred? Why? Beowulf, why don't you take the first position? In one sense, if anybody should pay Ware Guild, it should be Beowulf. But Hrothgar does. Probably because, I think at least, this has something to do with an old Indo-European practice. Indo-European, that group of people out of which all the various, you know, national groups that speak Indo-European languages came. And that's this idea of hospitality. Okay? You see it in Greek literature, Germanic literature, Roman literature, Hindu, Indian literature, Slavic literatures, etc. And that is that if someone comes to your door, it's the middle of a raging snowstorm, a rainstorm, or whatever, and that person bangs on your door, is your mortal enemy. You let that person in. You give that person shelter. And while that person is in your home, you are responsible for that person's safety. So if that person's greatest enemy comes banging on the door, attacking, not seeking shelter, it's your job to protect that person against his enemy, all right? So Hanshu has come, in one sense, with Beowulf and his men, seeking shelter. They are under Hrothgar's proverbial protection while there. Even though Beowulf lets him die, which is a re I think at least a problem with Beowulf's character. You raise that issue in certain circles and they don't like it because Beowulf's the man, you know. <clears throat> so he pays Wergild to Hanshu's uh, family. And the poet then says, the poet, not Hrothgar or anybody else, but our poet relating the story, 1055, 1054, gold be paid for the man whom Grindel had wickedly slain. He would have done more 
That is, Grendel would have done more if wise God and one man's courage had not prevented that fate. And there we are again. Notice, wise God, it's God's wisdom and one man's courage. So God's wisdom and Baal's, what does the courage produce? Or what, how does he demonstrate his courage? Strength. Okay? There's that fortitudio et, fortitudo et sapientia thing I had written on the board the other day. Had not prevented that fate. I'm trying to remember, is that word? 1057? Is that weird? Yes. Word that gets translated fate there is weird. If it had not prevented, that which will be, will be. So in other words, weird isn't, like the wanderer says, firmly established. It can be changed. How? God's wisdom and a little human ingenuity and skill or strength. The maker ruled all of the race of mankind as he still does. Go back to line 700 for a moment. You don't have to turn to it. but It is a well-known truth that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. Okay? Ruled, has ruled mankind always and forever. Has, present tense, ruled, past. It started in the past. It continues now and will go on into the future. But notice the different tense in, in 1060, or 1058. The maker ruled all of the race of mankind. Rule, simple past tense, as he still does. Why does the poet, the show singing the entire poem, let's say, for the first time, include as he still does. Why not just leave it in the past tense? Because we're talking about in Yardagum. What does as he still does do? Or what purpose does it serve? Okay. Keep going or listening to it because they probably wouldn't be reading it initially or possibly wouldn't be reading it. It might be speaking to the time of the current audience. God, as he yet does, yet does what? Still rules mankind. Why might the poet, sheer speculation, why might the poet see the need to say that now, same God. same God to work, possibly. What else? When do you need to hear that kind of statement? Do you need to hear that when you're just riding the top of the wave and life is wonderful and everything is beautiful and everything's coming up roses? No, it's when the wave crashes and you hit the bottom. Why? Because down here, God is still in control. Just like up here, God's in control. The poet, I would argue, is kind of preparing us for something. Something that's going to come in not too long. We're at 1058, around line 1780, I think it is, 1770. We're going to be at the beginning of what's called Hrothgar's homily, or Hrothgar's sermon. And Hrothgar's going to talk about God and being at the top of what in the later tradition will be called fortune's wheel and being at the bottom of fortune's wheel and how fortune fortune's a wheel that God spins God's in control of it all notice therefore understanding is always best the poet doesn't just stop God has ruled the fate of men or God God is what how does he put it the maker ruled all of the race of mankind as he still does. The poet doesn't just stop there. 
like he did in that previous passage, line 700 and following. The poet now does something else. Kind of applies it. The poet sounds more kind of like what at this point? Stepping up into the pulpit. This is, this is pure didacticism. This is pure teaching. Okay? Therefore, what does therefore mean? But. Louder? But. Can mean but. Because of this. Summation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of this is perfect. Thus. Thus is like one plus one, thus two. One plus one, therefore two. Okay? Therefore, understanding is always best. Spiritual foresight. Spiritual foresight is an appositive phrase for understanding. The poet is giving it more meaning. Understanding is spiritual foresight. Does foresight mean prophecy? No. It means seeing things clearly. We can look through this window, right? We can see what's outside. Can we see through it clearly? No, because this window hasn't been cleaned. I'm not kidding. It's probably 60 plus years. On the outside, this one may have been. Okay? This, by the way, is a new window. Those windows out there, you used to be able to open and close these windows. When I first started here, this window wasn't here, in fact. This wall <laughs> wasn't here. This was one larger classroom. <clears throat> Spiritual foresight. Here's what the spiritual foresight prepares one for. 1060. He must face much. Both love and hate. Who long here endures this world in these days of That might just be a generic statement, meaning life here sucks these days of strife. Or it can be, there's a possibility, the poet is talking about specific, a specific time period. Our specific days of strife. Okay? A lot of people have written on the audience of Beowulf. Uh, if, if any of you decide to write about Beowulf for, for some reason, Author named Dorothy Whitlock. Her name looks like it should be pronounced Whitelock. Wrote a book called The Audience of Beowulf. It's a little thin book, but in it she kind of argues for why she thinks the poem is later than earlier. And one of the reasons is because of all the Viking invasions. She can't see how somebody would copy the poem over hundreds of years when Vikings are ravaging everything. Notice what that presupposes. An audience of people, if it is written during that time period, who are having their homesteads, their cities, their churches, their monasteries ravaged by the Vikings. In other words, days of strife. So if that is the milieu in which the audience is, okay, what what do these lines produce in the audience? Hope? Or is it nothing is ever going to change? Like we get earlier in the poem. What happens to those who think nothing will ever change? That there will never be any comfort, any solace, any relief, any hope. They're the ones who thrust their souls into the fire's embrace. Hell here and now, right? If all life is, is strife, is pain, that pretty much is what's being talked about. That's hell. The poet is suggesting no matter what happens, imagine you're, you live in Turkey or Syria now. Massive, too massive, earthquakes, what, two weeks ago? And then just another one the other day. I've been in 6.3 earthquakes from being born and raised in California. Those are rocking and rolling. You'd be sliding all around. These deaths would not be in this 
place, these lamps would be falling the whole nine yards. Well, I mean, this building would probably, there's a sinkhole under Peck Hall, actually. It would probably go really quick. They've tried to fill it times. Anyways, God's still in control, the poet is saying, okay? And then back to the world of the poem, what does the poet do? In the world of the poem, that is in Herod, Ashot stands up and sings a song. The song is called The Finsburg Episode. Okay, why? Because it's about events that happen at a place called Finsburg. Burg just means encampment, fortress, fortified place, protected place. You can think of a castle if you want, but that's anachronistic. Castles date from 1000, 1050 AD later. Okay? So what happens in the Finsburg episode? By the way, there is also, do I have it written down somewhere? There is a Finsburg fragment. That is, there's a portion of a manuscript. Uh, I think the manuscript itself has actually been lost, but it was transcribed. It was copied in the 18th century. Uh, I think that's right. Could be wrong. Um, but again, it's incomplete. It's a portion. It's a fragment. It's not the whole poem. It's thought based upon that fragment, which contains some of the same stuff that's in this episode, okay, that the ultimate poem that it's frag fragment of and that this is an episode of was probably at least 600 lines and possibly much longer. That the Finsburg poem may have been as long as Beowulf. May have, we don't know, right? So why does the poet include this big, long, what's called an episode? In Beowulf, you have episodes and digressions, right? The little introduction to Haramode, that's called a digression. What does it mean to say, I digress? I got off topic, okay? That's what it means. An episode is when you don't get off topic, you're introducing something else that is part of the larger whole, okay? I would argue the digressions, they're not off topic. Every single one of them in the poem relates back to the central idea. And part of that central idea revolves around the feud. Okay? What do we see in the poem? Basic story, or the episode. Basic story. He doesn't show up, but there was a man named Hawk who was the leader of the Shieldings, after Shield, obviously. He had two children. A son named Hnath, H-N, the digraph A-E, Ash, the letter Ash, F, and a daughter named Hildebert. Lo and behold, a daughter who gets named, actually. Okay? She marries Finn, who is the leader of this group of Frisians. He's not the leader of all the Frisians. Just the Frisians at his fortress, right? They get married. They get married for one reason, apparently. To bring peace between the Shieldings and the Frisians. So she's described as a peace weaver. She is given in marriage to bring peace between these two warring peoples. It doesn't only happen in literature, it happens throughout history. That's why princes and princesses of different national groups would marry is to bring at least the lack of open warfare among them, okay? So, she gets married. She brings her own little group of retainers, that is, personal bodyguard, to live with her at Finsburg, where Finn rules. Her brother, Knef, and they have a son. He's not named. Hildebrand and Finn have a son. Her brother, Knef, and his warriors <clears throat> come to visit. And maybe they outstay their welcome. We don't know. But something happens, and the Frisians attack the Shieldings, 
who are staying in the main hall. Okay, remember what I said about hospitality? You don't attack people who you allow to stay in your home. But that's what they do. And Knaf gets killed, and her son gets killed. And the implication between this and the Fensberg fragment is they kill each other. Her son is what relation to him? Nothing. Probably. Probably. Okay, same relation. By the way, in ancient Germanic custom, the uncle-nephew relationship was tighter, closer than father-son. Because the uncle-nephew, the nephew, was often raised by the uncle to be taught how to be a warrior, or if the uncle was a king, how to be a good king. Okay? So, son gets killed, brother gets killed. Finn's men are outnumbered in the hall. Knaf's men, led by a man named Hengist, after he's dead, they enter into an agreement with the remaining Frisians. They're going to split up the hall, so put sheets down the middle, so to speak, Frisians on one side, shieldings on the other side. And they're going to stay like that during the winter. And this is all kind of described in the passage that I'm not going through line by line. But hopefully this will be faster. The Frisians agree to entertain the Shieldings during the winter months through song and revelry and sharing food, blah, blah, blah. Okay? They have a common funeral pyre, Hildebrand's request, to burn these two bodies on. So uncle and nephew were told the warrior arose. How? Smoke from the body rises. Spring comes. Hengist, oh, I need to mention something about Hengist. One of the reasons this passage was really interesting for early scholars of Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon England is to go back to Bede for just a moment. When Bede describes the Anglo-Saxon invasions, or the invasions of the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes, all right? Um, they were led by two chieftains, a guy named Hengist and his brother Horsa. Both names mean stallion, in other words, studs, all right? And the reason this was of great interest is because we have a name in Bede, and we have this name in Beowulf, and in the Finsburg fragment. And the question arose, same person? Because he lacked, we know, actual historical figures. According to Bede, there was at least one guy named Stallion, Hengist. Might this be the same one? Belongs to the correct tribes, or one of the tribes, because the Frisians, another name that's included here is the Jutes. Okay? Yeah. So, leave that aside. Spring comes. Hengist is thinking it's time to go home. Why didn't they go home before? Rivers were frozen. Couldn't get their boats out. And what does he think just before it's time to leave? Wait, 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 wait. Did I forget? Yes, I did. I'm going to have to come. Nope, that's later. Anglo-Saxon, uh, Germanic, fourfold ethic. Duty to one's lord. Duty to one's kin duty to avenge one's lord and kin. They entered a temporary peace. He still is bound to avenge his lord and kin, meaning half. So, Hengist's men attack, because they outnumber the Frisians. The Frisians. <coughs> and they attack to the extent that they kill them all. In this place, again, it's not all the Frisians. It's the Frisians at Finsburg. They kill them all. Okay? They go back to the land of the Shieldings, and who do they take with them? Hildebur. Describe Hildebur's life. I've seen facial expressions, but not descriptions. It's pretty rough, right? Days of strife. 
what was said just before this passage? God ruled all the race of men as he still does. Oh, by the way, let me tell you a story. Good story? Our modern mindset says, man, what a downer. What should they be saying? Beowulf, you just killed Grendel. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to Disney World, right? No, I'm going to hear a story about death and destruction and how a feud kills everyone, essentially. At least of this one group. So Hildebert's happy. Her son's dead. Her brother's dead. The implication is her father's already dead. Man, talk about days of strife. Her life's not very good. And then the poem ends. And we're told 1160, 1159 and 60. The lay was sung, the entertainer's song. Glad sounds rose again. In other words, let's have more beer. And yet the implication is that song is entirely appropriate in that scene, in that larger context. What happened before the song? Beowulf kills Grendel. What does Beowulf do in killing Grendel? What does he open? A feud with Grendel's mother. And what happens when you start a feud? Tit or tat. <laughs> Tit, it goes back and forth. Okay? Is, it, is this poet that is singing this poem supposed to be like an all knowing being? No, not an all knowing being, but someone who just has the tribal history all up in his head. Not. You mean, wait, which poet? You mean the poet within the world of the poem? Yeah, no, not an all-knowing being, just, you know. So he just happens to sing a song about a feud, and then later... Or, another way of putting it is, the poet telling us the story is arranging events, describing, plotting out everything, and, and puts this here for a reason. And I think the region has to do with both the macro understanding of the poem and the micro, that is, with this particular scene. Because what's going to happen very, very quickly, this same evening, Grendel's mother's going to come. Why? Beowulf started a feud. She's following, she literally, she follows Anglo-Saxon law. Perfect. Because what does she do? She kills one person. Beowulf killed Grendel, one person. She kills one in return. In fact, a guy wrote a, a um, dissertation on Anglo-Saxon law, kind of in Beowulf, in, in the poem Beowulf. And he talks about you know the various killings that we see, the big ones. You know, Grendel starting his thing, Beowulf killing Grendel, Grendel's mother, and Beowulf, how Beowulf kills here kills her, etc. And part of his argument is, you know, she's justified with her actions. And the poet takes us more inside her thoughts than the poet takes us in Grindel's thoughts. And in one sense, more than the poet takes us in at least some of Beowulf's thoughts. And she is, she's following the dictates of the law. You killed my son, I'm going to kill you. Or I'm going to kill one of your men. Where is Beowulf the night that she comes? He's not sleeping in Herod. He's sleeping in another building because in Herod, he has to sleep on the floor. He's on a bed this time. Question, comment? Um, so when I studied this before, they kind of like made Grendel out to be like this like stupid monster that didn't really have any idea like what he was really doing. And then they made his mother like, I don't know, she was kind of like this, like, I don't want to say divine, but she just seemed like a, she, they, she's like kind of put on a pedestal. Do you think that's because Grindel actually is like, just going around killing people, doesn't really know what he's doing? Or do you think it's just because we get more of her thoughts than his? Um, in, in, in terms of what you were taught before, that's probably what's going on. And she seems to have more rational reasons for what she does 
Um, I mean, we're going to get descriptions of her. Just one second. We're going to get descriptions of her. It's going to be interesting when Beowulf goes into her home. And I'm using that term intentionally. She has something hanging on the wall. She has a fire in the home. What does that kind of suggest? I mean, I kind of give it away by using the word home. It's not a cave. It's not just a cave. Why does she have something hanging on the wall? Why do you put anything on a wall? What does that suggest? Not this or this. It's a decoration. It's an ornament. Dad tells us what? This is not just some low-level monkey kind of being, an ogre, so to speak. She is an ogre. <laughs> so would it be correct like, to, to kind of say that the things or the episodes that the color play are trying to foreshadow what was going to happen with the ogre? Could be. Um, it, it's another re-emphasizing of feud. And feud, again, is woven all through. Notice, who comes out of this, so to speak, on top? Who comes out smelling like roses? Who comes out everything's going great for him? Nobody, not even Hengist. He loses his lord in this. I think one of the things the poet is doing throughout the entire poem is the poet is calling into question the entire Germanic heroic ethos. This whole idea, duty to one's lord, one's king, duty to avenge, it ends up with what? Death. Everywhere. How does the wanderer end up? Alone. Exiled. Burying his lord. The hall. Gone. Okay. The poet's kind of going to allude to the same kinds of things in here, okay? So, that all ends. Wealthyau comes forward. She brings a crown to where the good two sat. Who good two? Nephew and uncle. We've just heard about a nephew and uncle who killed each other. And now we have this nephew and uncle. Where we are told, their peace was still whole. Notice, two adverbs of time. Still, then. What does that mean? Ain't gonna last. Each true to the other. And you have a footnote. And the footnote says, or alludes to, you know, um, actually, that's gonna come up. Uh, Came up earlier with stuff about Rolf, but the same thing applies. Uncle, nephew, uncle, nephew. Their peace was still holding. And what we get is like a, um, what's the word? A tableau, an image. So you have Hrothgar, Hrothulf, Unferth, sitting at their feet. And we're told their peace was, they still had their peace then, and then the poet, notice, specifically mentions Unferth. Why? What does Unferth have to do with anything else here? Louder? Kinslain? We've already had the allusion to uncle, nephew, Hrothulf, Hrothgar. We've had it here. Kinslain. There's no other reason to emphasize that, Hroth, that Unferth is sitting at their feet, like spreading a poison, kinsley, sin if you want, in the Germanic sense, just oozing out like an oil spill. Everyone trusted his spirit, that he had great courage. This is the poet, of our poet, telling us, not within the world of the poem. But the poet is telling us what everyone in the world of the poem thinks about Unferth. That he had great courage, though to his kinsmen he had not been merciful in swordplay. So the poet puts Unferth there and then reminds us, Kinslayer. But everybody in the world of the poem, except for Beowulf, I think it's pretty fair to say, assumes what? Oh. 
He's a courageous hero. How courageous was he against? Grendel. Not so much. I'm going to sleep over here in the Motel 6. Tell me, even after Beowulf, they had that little rift. What was it called? The, um, where Beowulf, like... The flitting episode? Yeah, um, yeah everybody so, still trusts them. So everybody, oh, well, that's and that's one of the conundrums, which is the way it's explained by the vast majority of scholars is that it's read or heard by the people in the world of the poem as Beowulf isn't serious. This is just a your mama game. That's, that's, all, that's all a lot of scholars think of it. Well, yeah, well, you're a mama, and what do you do? You one up the person who insults your mama. Is it meant seriously? Your mama sleeps with pigs. No, it's not. I don't mean that seriously. That you're, you know. It's a verbal contest. That's all it is. And there's no seriousness to it. Even though the poet has twice now reaffirmed what Beowulf said. And that, to me, you can't say, oh, well, that's just part of the verbal contest. When the poet says it, because when the poet says it, the people in the world of the poem, they don't hear that. That's meant for our ears, not theirs. They hear what Beowulf said. And Roth goes around, hey, where did it go? Keep in mind, he's old. He might not be that sharp. Okay? So she comes in and she addresses Hrothgar about what? I mean, specifically. I've heard told that you want to adopt this one as an heir. Talking about Beowulf. Well, where was she? When Hrothgar said, you are like a son to me in my heart. Remember this kinship. She should have, according to the description, she was in the area, or did Hrothgar go up and whisper to Beowulf's ear? We're not told that. Okay? And she goes on and says, leave the folk in the kingdom to your sons. Hrothric, and if he dies, Hrothmund. Hrothric's the oldest son. I know my own dear gracious, dear gracious Hrothulf will hold and honors these youths. So look at lines 1180 through 1191, or her speech ends at 1187. Who's she speaking to versus who's she speaking about? She's talking to her husband, but who's she talking about? Hrothulf. And what does she say? Oh, I know. Dear gracious Rolf, he'll remember our sons in honor or treat our sons honorably when he remembers all the kindnesses we did since we raised him as a boy. What does she really mean? Again, a lot of scholars read that. Total surface level. What, what's she saying? We can trust Rolf. Anybody want to offer a counter to that? I think she's being totally sarcastic. And she's saying, I trust Rolf as far as I can kick him. Which ain't very far. Just I was going to say, well, so she says, I expect he would wish to, would wish to repay both his sons kindly, implying like maybe he can't, like he was incapable of doing it, even though he wants to. That's a, pos that's a plausible reading. I think that's an idiom, meaning I think he wants to. Okay? But again, I read that as, I mean, it's, it's layered with sarcasm. She goes on. Okay? She gives Beowulf this ring to wear around the neck, a neck collar. And the very next thing the poet does, after giving us the history of the ring, your footnote tells you, Supposedly, this thing was worn by the Norse goddess Freya, who was like the Aphrodite of Norse goddesses. Okay? Just adds to her appeal. And then we get this little short digression. Okay? Digression. Helak's going to wear this thing on his Frisian raid, and he's going to die, and it's going to get taken. It's the first of three 
references to Helix Rishin Raid. And notice why the poet says he did it. 1206. When in his pride he went looking for woe, a feud with the Frisians. He went looking. It means they hadn't been in a feud before. He starts a feud. Where do you think that feud ends? It doesn't end with his death. It doesn't end until the future after the end of the poem. It's alluded to, it's prophesied. There is going to be all hell to pay when Beowulf dies for the Geats. Okay? And notice, by the way, in his pride he did this. And his name, one interpretation of his name is Lack Thought. Dummy. It's another big giant dummy, okay, if you want. Um, okay, it's 11.05, so we're going to pick up, didn't get as far as I wanted to, we're going to pick up with 12.05 where she's going to speak again. Um, I'm going to put up a quiz today over the first thousand lines and the background introduction stuff to Beowulf. Uh, it'll be, today's Tuesday, it'll be due Friday. I'm going to try to get us done with Beowulf at the very latest by end of next Tuesday. Dr. Yes.